Is that wood? <laughs> wood? So, are you ready to go forward? You want me to say good morning? You want to say good morning? Good morning. The, uh, the microphone is on. Praise the Lord. Years ago when I was a teacher, we, we did the, uh, the show uh, Oklahoma. And anyway, there's a, there's a, a, a loud gunshot at one point, and, and I had the stage crew with, a, with the starting pistol from the track coach. And little did we know that there was a microphone right where I were. The guy was standing with this. That was one loud gunshot. <laughs> Pretty near blew out the speakers. Um, we need all of the children to come forward by Joan for our first song this morning. Or anyone that identifies as a child. <laughs> so please come up. And are you are you are are you going to teach them first? Should I take them through the song real quick? We're going to do we're going to do a song that everybody should know, and I'm not going to play. We're just going to sing it because and Joan's going to Joan's going to be doing something with the kids. But this is the old. This is the day. This is the day. So can you sing that with me? Here we go. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in this, and be glad in this. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in this. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. So if, if we were if we were doing music next week, we would uh, we would rehearse the sign language with all of you so that you would have to do that next week. We'd repeat this. But so since we're not going to be here next week, they'll all have to do it with us today at the end of the service. Amen. <laughs> um, welcome, to, welcome to Linden Bible Church, where we love the Lord and we love praising the Lord and we love honoring mothers on Mother's Day and we just love that you're here. So. Please stand and join with us and praise uh, the Lord with, with your whole heart. Bless. 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, when the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all that it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Chains are gone, I've been set. 
powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and be Moms have it so easy. I mean, their lives are fun, simple, and, and so rewarding. 
Sometimes I wish, instead of being the dad, I, I wish I was the mom. Ah, oh, another day of pedicures, reading my magazines, and making myself beautiful. This is the life. Mom? Mom, tell it to stop copying me. Mom, tell him to stop copying me. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Mom, do something. Mom, do something. Are you serious? Are you serious? Mom, are you serious? Why did I ever ask you to help me? I should have known you couldn't fix my hair. I look like a freak. Look at me. Look at me. Hey, Mom. Look at this. Look at me. Come on, Mom. Look at me. Watch this, Mom. Come on. Look at this. Watch this. Come on, look at me. Come on, Mom. Look at me. Come on, Mom. Look at me. Come on. Mom, I have a book report due tomorrow and I haven't read any of this. Mom, if you don't help me, I'm gonna fail school and be a loser forever. You don't expect me to read this all by myself, do you? You don't expect me to eat this, do you? Seriously, Mom, what is this? Mom, I'm not gonna eat this. Dad, can we just go out to eat, please? Hey kids, be nice to your mother. If I eat this, I'm gonna throw up. Mom, I said I'm gonna throw up. No. <laughs> Mom, I think I'm gonna be sick too. <laughs> You're amazing. No, seriously. I don't know how you do it. I, I, I'm at a loss for words. Kids, come here, get in here, hug your mother. Tell her you love her. We're in the presence of greatness. Dad. Not now, dad's on a roll. This is God's greatest creation, kids. You're smushing my face. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry, because I don't say thank you enough. I mean, the truth is, I don't deserve you. We don't deserve you. And one day is, is not enough to honor you. We, we should honor you every day. But how do we say thank you to the woman that means the world to us? I know. We're gonna go right now and get you that vacuum cleaner you've had your eye on. <laughs> Nothing. Shh, 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 shh. Don't speak. This time, we're going name brand, baby. Come on, kids. Let's go make your mom's dreams come true. Good morning. One of the joys of being a Christian is we can humble ourselves and laugh at ourselves, <laughs> particularly you guys. <laughs> Another joy of being a Christian is I get entrusted with all these. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to thank the moms today and honor them a little bit with uh, a tradition we have here of, of giving out uh, certificates for free uh, maple smoothies, um, which shows why I'm entrusted with these. <laughs> Would someone like to help give them out? Would you kids like to help give them out to the moms? Yeah? Would any moms that would like an ice cream, please stand and we'll get you one of these certificates. Here, kids. Go ahead. Go ahead, give them to the moms, okay? Go give them to the moms. Would you like to? You help. No.
All the kids went to the other side. <laughs> Not enough for that kid. Need some more? Sure. Yeah, I got a few more. Wow. <laughs> Maybe giving out dollars in a minute. <laughs> Well, the Lord supplied just a few more than needed. <laughs> I'll, I will turn these in. I'm not bringing them home. <laughs> anyway, it's it's great to just um, take this time to you know to honor moms and and um, if if you didn't read uh, Fred's devotional this week out of uh, Proverbs 31, I just wanted to read a few verses out of that, starting in, in verse 25 about moms. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her. Many women have done excellency, but you surpass them all. What a great word. What a great word for moms. You know, we all have a mother. Some were better than others. Some we struggle with, some blessed us mightily. But we need to love and honor them all. And maybe even forgive them. We each have our own thing, but we each have a mother that brought us into this world. And, and God knit us in her womb from the very beginning. So let's pray. Lord God, we come together today, we take a special moment to, to honor moms, each of our moms, Lord. We pray, we, we pray for them, Lord. We pray for strength. We pray for, for, for happiness, Lord. We pray that they have wisdom and patience, Lord. For those of us that may have struggled with our moms, put forgiveness in our hearts, Lord, for whatever the reason is. And we may not know the reason, Lord but we know we're called to forgive and we're called to love. Lord God, I pray too for the mothers of the future, Lord, that they care well for their babies, Lord. From the moment of conception on, Lord God, we just pray, we pray for those mothers, Lord, throughout the land, throughout the world, Lord, and even those mothers in difficult times, mothers that may have lost a child or have a child that's gone off the path terribly, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for their strength. We pray for their faithfulness, Lord God. But most of all, we thank you for them, Lord. We thank you for our mothers. And we honor them today, Lord, in your name. So you'll be glorified for supplying them for us, Lord. We pray, too, just for our message today. Speak mightily through Joel. Open our hearts. Open our ears. Let us be one with you for the time we spend together today and even as we leave here. Fill our hearts with joy. Let us bring that into the community, Lord. Shine through us, because we are your people and you are our God. In Jesus' name, amen. kids and thank you moms. Uh, happy Mother's Day to all of you here today. Uh, my wife's out with our daughter today and uh, our grandchildren and enjoying a Mother's Day and it's also my daughter's birthday today so it's a big special day for them so uh, we know they're celebrating. I got to text them this morning so and do a little FaceTiming yesterday so grateful for that. Um, so we'll allow all those involved in Children's Church the opportunity to be dismissed. 
This way moms can relax a little bit, <laughs> except the ones in children's church. <laughs> You know, one of the one of the great things about um, the funny videos is that Sue and I spend the week um, talking about, I mean, reviewing videos. So we see five or six of these to choose from. So we we have a good laugh in the office <laughs> as we're reviewing them and have to choose just one. So <laughs> um, that's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I want to continue today with our series on 40 Days of Favor. So this is going to be part two, and there'll be more parts to follow. Um, and uh, so if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Luke 24. We're going to get there eventually. Um, but as I was thinking about this message today, um, and, and Bill prayed for open ears and open hearts, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I was thinking of a just in a, something that happened in our family many years ago that um, just always brings a smile to my face. Um, when our kids were little around the table and, and Christy's brother and, and uh, sister-in-law were, were up visiting and, uh, and Uncle Tim loves kids and, and he was the entertainment that day at the table and, uh, and so he was entertaining our kids with a magic trick and what he would do is he would take a, a spoon in his hand and, and he would make it disappear. And, and so he would pound his, his uh, hands on the table, you know, there was the spoon, there was the spoon, and then it was gone. <clears throat> and so as he was doing this, and my kids were so impressed, he could make the spoon disappear. How does Uncle Tim do that? You know, he, he's doing magic for us. And, and then he do it again, do it again, Uncle Tim. So he'd do it again, and except... The last time he did it, you know, he did the, showed the spoon, showed the spoon, and it was gone, but we heard this clatter on the floor. <laughs> and all the adults were kind of giggling under their breath because he was dropping it in his lap. <laughs> and, uh, but the kids, interestingly, didn't catch on. And, and Mary Lou, his wife, is say, making excuses about the clatter on the floor. And, <laughs> and they were still thinking about the, the spoon disappeared. Because they, were, they believed what they saw. They were seeing, but they weren't really perceiving the truth of the situation. And, um, and you know, during those 40 days of favor when, when Jesus rose from the dead, and we're going to go back there today um, to Resurrection Sunday, and, and uh, this was part of the problem with the disciples of Jesus, that they, they were seeing, but they weren't always believing. Um, and... and as I said last week, just by way of review, why, why did Jesus not just rise from the dead and go straight to heaven? Uh, what, what were these 40 days of favor from, from the resurrection to the ascension about? And I'd like to, again, suggest three things. One was to present proof of his actual resurrection, his bodily resurrection. It took time, as we're going to see this morning, again, to overcome the doubts, even among his own followers, there was a lot of wavering at first, and, and we can understand that because resurrections don't happen every day. Um, they weren't prepared for it, though they should have been. Uh, and the second reason was to prepare his disciples for the ministry of the gospel he had for them after his ascension. So, so he was doing prep work for his departure, um, and he was letting them know that, you know, that, that full manifestation of the kingdom coming to Israel and the restoration of Israel and Jesus on the throne wasn't going to happen quite yet. There was going to be a delay in that, but that he had another kingdom program for them. And so the third reason was really to commission his disciples um, for his, his present kingdom here on earth. And his mission for them in the present age was it, given in the Great Commission to make disciples, baptizing, teaching them, uh, all that I've told you, and, uh, and then to um, establish his kingdom here on earth through the church of Jesus Christ, and that church is going to be inaugurated right after, after he departs uh, on the day of Pentecost, and we'll get to that on the first Sunday in June. Um, so this Easter, we're, we're taking not just a day of resurrection, but kind of a season of resurrection, looking at these 40 days when Jesus walked on this earth, and some of the lessons, I think, that we can learn from that. 
So I want to again invite you to walk with me through some scriptures, look at these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and learn some of the lessons he taught his followers and for us as well. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the accounts of Mary Magdalene, the first witness of the resurrection, and, uh, and then we saw the Apostle Peter, who was the second witness to the resurrection. And so this morning, I'd like to continue with the account of two disciples uh, on the road to Emmaus, and then the uh, two accounts of the other 11 apostles. Um, and by the way, we use those church, uh, terms interchangeably, sometimes disciple and apostle, uh, they were all disciples or followers of Christ, but Jesus chose those 12, you remember, at the beginning of his ministry to be apostles or specially sent ones with unique power and authority in the church and, and to be the foundation stone of the church. And, uh, and so, you know, now Judas is gone, uh, so there, there's 11 of those apostles, and we're going to talk about some of them today. But th this is um, the story of two men. Uh, two disciples of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and it's found in Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. Uh, and the time now is sometime later on Sunday. We know early in the morning he, he appeared to the women, and then a little later in the day he appears to uh, uh, Simon Peter. We don't know exactly when, but uh, sometime later on Resurrection Sunday, perhaps early in the afternoon or something, uh, this, this, the story comes of the two men on the road to Emmaus. This is one of my favorite stories of the Easter season. I love this story. One of the reasons I love it is there's so much humor in it. It's just hilarious. Uh, while they're trying to get it and don't get it yet, how Jesus interacts with them. So I hope we'll see some of that humor along the way. But it starts with what I call closed eyes in verses... <clears throat> 13 through 24, and the closed eyes begins with a closed mind in verse 13 through 15. It says, that very day, so again, this is Resurrection Sunday, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So, you know, in the New American Standard, it, it starts this with behold. <laughs> uh, that means look up, listen up. This is your mother saying, sit up straight and listen. <laughs> and so the account begins with grabbing our attention, and it talks about two of them, and we find out that these are disciples of Jesus, and we find out later in verse 18 that one of them is named uh, Cleopas. Uh, the, others, the other we don't know. Um, and they're on their way to Emmaus. Uh, Emmaus means warm baths, for whatever that means. Um, they were about to get a warm bath on their heart that day. And, and they are traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's about seven miles away. So it's, it's not a huge, long, long distance, but maybe a two-hour walk on a, on a normal walking uh, uh, pace. And, and they're talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. One of the amusing things of Easter Sunday morning is the conversations. And I just think God's looking down from heaven and Jesus is watching all this and, and he's got to be amused at the conversations uh, that happened that day. Um, they're perhaps discussing, I think, all of the events they're going to let us know. Um, you know, you know, first of all, the, the evidence is starting to accumulate. You know, it's, it's the empty tomb and the stone thrown out of the way, and, and, and the, the women went and, and found this and, and reported back, and, and, and then, you know, Mary went and went back, and, and, and she comes back and says that Jesus has appeared to her, and these guys don't know this part yet, but Jesus appears to Peter. Um, so they're talking about this accumulation of evidence, and what does this mean, and what's this all about? It's shocking. You know, they've been embedded in deep grief and shock at the crucifixion. And now three days later, they're hearing these bizarre reports and, and trying to make sense of it. And, uh, and it's, it's kind of become the talk of the town. Um, and, and they know Peter and John went to check out the women's story and at least found things like they said. Um, they didn't see Jesus. Um, but at that point, but, you know, the vision of angels, all of these things. And... Um, and the way that it, it's, it says in verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, and it, 
The indication here is it's kind of banter. It's back and forth. And later Jesus is going to say, what are these things that you're, you're kind of throwing back, literally throwing back and forth to each other? It was a very lively conversation. You know, well, Cleo, what do you think? Well, I don't know, Jake. This is what I think. Well, what about this? And wh- why did that happen? And, and what's going, what, do you, what do you make of it all? Um, and so they're having this lively discussion. And, and the lively discussion is, what happened to Jesus? <laughs> you know, what happened to Jesus? I mean, there's no body there anymore. Uh, and while they're discussing what happened to Jesus, who shows up? Jesus shows up. <laughs> I love it. And Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You know, he's the mysterious stranger, the mysterious traveler on this journey to Emmaus. Uh, suddenly, this guy catches up with them, and, uh, and he starts walk, uh, walking with them and listening with them. And, um, you know, but, but their, their eyes, their, um, their minds were closed to the whole idea of the resurrection at this point. And not only were their eyes, clo- uh, their, excuse me, their minds closed, their eyes were closed, according to verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This is an interesting thing. Um, seems to me the indication is that this might have been a divine um, hiding of Jesus, of, of the reality of the person of Jesus. We see the same thing with Mary Magdalene. She didn't write. She thought he was the gardener, you know? And, and so God didn't, in his wisdom, allow them to immediately recognize the person, the bodily person of Jesus. Um, and, and so their eyes were closed to the fact that this was Jesus. See, they were seeing something physically, this person walking beside them, not listening, talking, but spiritually, they couldn't perceive anything yet. Um, I was thinking that, you know, sometimes when someone dies and we have a funeral and memorial service and, and we're thinking of memories of them and then suddenly the grief intrudes on that, you know. Um, and that's kind of what happens next. Jesus says to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. <laughs> and Jesus says, what's this banter you're talking about? What, what's, this whole, what's this whole thing you're talking about? There's people seeing this, this the empty tomb, and, you know, what, and, and, and they, they just stop. I, I think probably they literally stopped on the road. And, and sadness intervenes again. It's like, you know, thinking of that memory of that loved one, and suddenly they're, they're gone. They're not here. And... and you know, and, and they're just sad and still. I mean, this is part of what they're dealing with. And, and I was thinking that, you know, with Jesus showing up, it's kind of like Jesus showing up at his own wake <laughs> and, and saying, uh, where's the deceased? <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, this is kind of the, the funny part of this story is Jesus asking them, you know, and he's, and he's kind of playing dumb a little bit here. He, he's... he's He's leading them on to, to express some things. Um, but their hearts are still closed. And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Um, you know, what an irony. <laughs> He's the only one who don't, knows the whole truth. He experienced the truth. He was resurrected. He knows all about what's happening. He knows all about the appearances. And they're like... You must be the only guy in this whole city, in this whole Passover celebration with people from all over the world who don't know what's going on. I mean, this is the talk of the town. Everybody's talking about it. And, and this is one of the proofs of the resurrection. It was no little secret. The whole town knew, you know. And, 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 Jesus, and, and they say to him, are you the only one? I mean, I just later on, I just think they had to laugh about this. And, and Jesus, uh, he said to them, what things? <laughs> and they said to him, and then they, they explain their belief about Jesus. Concerning Jesus of, of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and w- word before God and all the people. So they begin to explain to him who Jesus is, Jesus of Nazareth and, and, and a mighty prophet. 
And then how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Interesting, they put the blame on the, the Jewish rulers, not the Romans so much. Um, and, and they talk about his suffering and his crucifixion. But then they say, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. You know, this tells us something about their hope. You know, their hopes had been crushed at the cross. They had lost hope. Uh, and, and specifically that they had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. In other words, we had hoped, we had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. <laughs> and, and, and we had put all of our hope in him. And the implication is, and now that has been disappointed. Um, and, and then they go on um, and said, yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. That should have rung a bell in their mind since he said, in three days I'm going to rise from the grave three times to them right before. Um, but it didn't yet. Um, and then they go on and, and say, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. So these are all the reports. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen even a vision of angels who said that he was alive, you know, not that they actually saw angels, but a vision. Uh, some of those who were with us went to the tomb, this would be Peter and John, and found it just as these women had said, but him they did not see. So still, their, their, their hearts are closed. And because their hearts are closed to the truth, their eyes are closed, and their minds are closed. So with these two men, it's a, it's a whole closed mind on, on this resurrection day that it begins with. But it's about to change because Jesus is about to open their hearts, starting in verse 25. Um, it says in verse 25, <clears throat> uh, And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? You know, in order to open their hearts, Jesus begins to say to them, I mean, he calls them foolish and slow of heart to believe. <laughs> and then he begins to explain that all of the Old Testament should have informed you about this. Um, in other words, Scripture should have informed you about this. Um, their, their hearts were closed because they didn't understand God's word. Not because of the physical experiences or seeing him. It was because they didn't understand God's word. You see, seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. <laughs> That's the key to, to truly seeing and perceiving. And, and he explains to them that it was part of the plan of God for this Messiah that you had hoped in to first suffer and die. God had a bigger plan than the one you were focused on. You know, and the bigger plan was, was that the Messiah was going to come, but he was going to be a suffering Messiah. Isaiah 53 and Psalm 16 and all of those Old Testament passages that talk about the suffering of Christ. And, and, and he's saying that was part of God's plan. You missed that part of God's plan in his word. You should have paid attention to God's word. Then you would know what to believe. Uh, and you would know you would be able to see um, and that he should do all these things before he enters into his glory, which is going to happen at the end of the 40 days. And then he opens their hearts by opening their minds through Scripture. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning themselves. You know, there... The, I, I just would have loved for <laughs> to been there. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to walk with Jesus that day? I mean, this is... This is like Old Testament 101 taught by Jesus. <laughs> and, and this is Bible study of Jesus on, by Jesus. Uh, and so Jesus begins to go through the scriptures, through all of the Old Testament, and he begins to explain passage by passage by passage what they had missed about the prophecies of the Messiah. And how he had to suffer and he had to die so that he could redeem not just Israel, but the whole world. Um, and, and he begins to give them this great uh, Bible study, this, this you know, life group with Jesus kind of thing. Um, and all of the scriptures concerning himself. 
Um, and so after he opens their, their minds through Scripture, and by the way, later on in verse 32, it says, did not our hearts burn within us as he taught us the word? You know, there was the conviction of the Holy Spirit on their heart that it was like, it was getting warmed. <laughs> it was getting hot that day. It was just like conviction. Why didn't we see this? Why didn't we understand this? Why, you know, I missed this, you know? Just like we do when we read scripture and we've read it a hundred times and then suddenly it leaps out at us. I never saw that before. Um, but that's what was happening to them that day. Um, and after opening their minds through scripture, he opens their hearts. I mean, their uh, eyes. I'm going to get that mixed up all day long. I've been having trouble with mixing things up since my wife left. <laughs> I changed the whole board meeting and everybody's schedule on the board because I got the wrong day when she's coming back. <laughs> and then we had to change it back again. So you have to pardon me. That's my excuse today. <laughs> Mother isn't here. <laughs> But anyways, verse 28 says, So they drew near to the village which they were going. He acted as if he were going, were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Um, so now their eyes are finally going to be opened. And I, I just love this story again. Jesus acts, and, you know, the word here that he acted as if he was going to go on. It's the same word when, when they were on, uh, the disciples were on the storm. And he acted like he was going to walk on the water past them, you know. It's, it's you know, he's, oh, I'll just go on. He wasn't going to invite himself. Um, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's getting dark, you know. You need to come, you know, you need to come stay with us. Jesus. Have a meal with us. And this was common hospitality of that day. And, and you know, the words that he had spoken to them were, were pressing on their hearts. And, and they just want to be with this guy. And they, they want to know him more. And they wanted to hear more of what he had to say and, and I'm sure they were convincing, you know, Rachel cooks a great meal, you got to stay, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, don't, don't you think so, Cleo? Oh, yeah, you got you to gotta stay. Come, come stay with us. Stay, stay with us for, for tonight. Come have, have dinner with us. And, and so Jesus is convinced, and, and, uh, and he decides to stay, and, and he acknowledged. And then just imagine sitting down to dinner, and, and it's obvious now he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, and and let's let the rabbi pray. It's not like, get the pastor to pray, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, will you, will, you, will you say the blessing for the meal, uh, Jesus? And, and uh, I don't think he, they knew his name yet. But, <laughs> you know, and certainly, you know, takes perhaps the bread in his hand, lifts his eyes to heaven as he often did, and, and he begins to, to break the bread and he, pray over that bread and break the bread with them. And it clicked. <laughs> Perhaps it was the memory uh, that they'd heard of the upper room. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe it was another dinner they'd have with Jesus. But suddenly it all came to bear on their hearts. Suddenly the veil was lifted and, and God took away the blinders. And they know nobody prays like that. <laughs> this is Jesus. <laughs> this is why he knew all of that Old Testament that talked about himself. Because he is himself. This is Jesus. And guess what? He's alive. <laughs> and we're having dinner with him. <laughs> wow. You know, I'm sure that they're just about to pour out like a million questions. How did it happen? When did you get here? Well, we heard about Mary. Peter told us it. He's gone. Huh. Just when Jesus shows up and everything becomes clear, he disappears. Shoot. <laughs> Why does he do that? You know, couldn't you stay a little longer, Jesus? But now they believe. It's been confirmed by Scripture. It's been confirmed by Jesus' own words in the explanation of Scripture. It's been confirmed by their eyes. Their minds are now opened and they know that they know that this is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Their eyes were finally open. 
And the last thing that happens to these guys is their mouths got opened as well. And they arose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. Remember, it's late in the day. They're having dinner. It's seven miles back to Jerusalem. This is, a, this is, the, this is the 7K, so to speak. <laughs> I, I would have loved to have been there as they ran back to Jerusalem. <laughs> you know, I don't care if it's dark. We're going to get there. We're going to tell everybody we saw them. We saw them. We ate with them. You know, <laughs> when do we tell them, you know? And they run, and interesting, they know where to find the 11. And the 11 here, I'm just going to tell you, I, I, didn't, I didn't make a mistake. It's, it's the 11, but that was kind of a technical term uh, for the, the apostles at this point because Judas is gone because we're going to find out that this, the first encounter with them, there's only 10 of the 11 there, but later there's going to be 11. So Luke compresses the account a little bit more than John does, but they found the 11, and those who were with them gathered together. And, and, and notice it says saying. Now, who's saying this? This, is, this isn't the two guys from Emmaus that are saying this. This is the rest of them talking back to those guys. Wait till you hear what we have to say. No, we got something first. <laughs> and what they say is, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. You know, on top of all the other evidence, they now know that Peter saw the Lord too. He's seen the risen Lord. Um, and then they get to share. Okay, our turn. <laughs> then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. That, that, I, I tell you, I'm, I've been meditating on that for years, and I, I, I still don't fully understand it. <laughs> how it. Why it was so important that it was revealed to them in the breaking of bread. Somehow, in the fellowship that happens in the breaking of bread, Jesus shows up. Jesus becomes who he is. And maybe part of the lesson in that is our desperate need for fellowship with the people of the Lord, you know? Because it's in that, fe and table fellowship was intimate fellowship. Um, and, 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 and as we have intimate fellowship with the Lord, and, and I would say even more so when we celebrate communion, when we, when we break the bread and, and drink the, the wine, the grape juice, whatever, um, you know, God's presence shows up in a unique way during that time of communion. Um, I can't give you a detailed explanation of it. I just know that that's true. An old elder once told us that there is a special presence of the Lord during our communion time. Um, and, and so it's neat that, that that's how it opened. And, and they, opened their, their <laughs> they opened their mouths to tell others about it. You know, one of the lessons I, I learned from these guys is that the essential importance of knowing God's word, believing God's word, and having a burning passion for God's word. In fact, knowing God's word, believing God's word, was more important than seeing physically Jesus. You know, it was through the word that Jesus brought the reality to their hearts. And as soon as they know that, they didn't need to see him any longer. He disappeared. Oh. And isn't that true for us? <laughs> we don't get to experience the physical presence of Jesus. But we have something more important. We have his word. And we have added to that Old Testament all of the New Testament as well. Oh, and Jesus' words. You know, this, this week I was talking with a brother and, and uh, we were talking about the importance of, of being in the word and, and being in fellowship with others and, um, and, and how that's just basic Christianity. You know, you got to be in the word or you can't grow in the Lord. You've got to be in fellowship with other believers or you're going to become an oddity. You're, you're not going to grow and be a balanced, mature believer. Uh, and we were talking about that and, and he said, you know, this is... I, we should just put it on little cards and hand it out to people. <laughs> and I thought that was a great idea, you know. Basic Christianity, okay. <laughs> Read the word, meditate, pray, you know. Spend time with God's people. Uh, we can't do it without that. And I think that's one of the lessons of these, these two guys. Um, well, the second pe person I want to bring, actually people I want to bring before you this morning is the ten apostles. And they're, they're found in verses, it actually begins back in 33 where we say they found the 11. I think it was 10 at this point. But, um, and, and it's um, probably late Sunday because remember these guys had to walk all the way back or run all the way back from Emmaus. Um, 
So, so late that day um, comes the report of the, the two guys from Emmaus. They've come, they've made their report, they've exchanged information. And then in verses uh, 36 and following, we see the appearance of Jesus. And as they were talking about these things, <laughs> don't you love that again? They're talking about the appearances of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday and who shows up? Jesus. <laughs> as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. Uh, or, or, you know, I think the, John's gospel says, uh, peace be with you. Uh, I like that. Uh, peace be with you. The first thing that Jesus speaks to them when he appears is his peace. Peace be with you. Um, and uh, he gives to these troubled disciples uh, a proclamation of peace. It says, but they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Again, still having trouble with the bodily resurrection. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Uh, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Um, so he begins with proclaiming peace to them because he's the Prince of Peace and he's here. <laughs> And then he gives them the proof of his bodily resurrection. Um, you know, stop being troubled. Stop being doubtful. Look, this is where, this is where the, the spikes went in on my hands and, and my feet. Uh, maybe he lifted up his shirt, you know. This is where the spear went in. Um, uh, he says, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see, uh, see that I have. Um, and, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy. Now, there's an interesting thought. Uh, they were marveling. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? <laughs> so a second meal for him. Uh, they gave him a piece of bro broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. He's showing them, I'm not a ghost. Okay? I'm not just a spirit. I've got the marks in my hands and my feet. Uh, this is me. This is me in bodily form. Yes, glorified form. He just appeared among them and he appears places and other places. Um, but he says, this is me. This is the Jesus you know. Uh, give me something to eat. Eat some fish, you know. Oh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't get invisible when it went down, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's just here eating with us, showing us his hands and his feet. Um, uh, and, and they're, you know, disbelieving for joy. I mean, they're moving towards belief, right? <laughs> but it's so good they could hardly believe it. Have you ever had things like that happen in your life? Something that just turned out so much better than you expected, you just think, I can't even believe it. It's this good. <laughs> I can guarantee you it wasn't a computer. <laughs> We've had trouble with those this week. <laughs> uh, and then he opens uh, their minds to God's plan in Scripture, beginning in verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So this is Bible study 102. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So Jesus begins to, uh, again, open their minds to God's word and to God's whole plan of salvation. Now they're beginning to see God's plan of redemption, the Messiah's, the Messiah's mission is way bigger than we thought. It, we thought it was just to come back and restore Israel. and, and may, No, God had a way bigger plan. His plan is worldwide, and his plan is to, to establish his kingdom beginning in the church of Jesus Christ to all of the world. Um, and, and, and so he begins to tell them how it was necessary for the Messiah or Christ to suffer and die and also on the third day rise from the dead. And this is why, because this is the only way that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You know, we sang that this morning. The name of Jesus is powerful. <laughs> and it's in his name that we proclaim the gospel, the good news, that because Jesus died on the cross and because he's resurrected and because he paid for your sins and my sins on the cross, we can experience forgiveness. 
when we repent of our sins and put our faith in him and what he's done for us. And our mission is to proclaim it uh, to all the world. Um, And then he commissions them to be his witnesses. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You know, he said, I've got a mission for you. And it's a pretty simple one, really. Be my witnesses. (laughs) I've done something for you. You've received that. And now you're my witnesses. Now, they were actual eyewitnesses to the resurrection. But we, too, are called, Acts 1-8, to be his witnesses. To, you know, starting at home, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Um, You know, it is a global mission that he is giving to them to simply open our mouths and witness to what God has done in our hearts and lives. It's that simple. We just have to open our mouths and say, this is what Jesus did for me. (laughs) Uh, We were talking about this in our our youth group uh, this morning, just, you know, truth and love, and and that we need both. Uh, That we need the truth wrapped in love, but but that's what we're called to do, to be witnesses to those things. Um, So to troubled and doubting disciples, Jesus comes with a proclamation of peace. And what a wonderful word from Jesus. Peace be with you. Are there things troubling your heart and your mind this morning, bringing doubts to your mind? Perhaps you need to hear the Prince of Peace speak a word to you. Let my peace be with you. Jesus brings peace to his disciples, proof of who he is, a purpose for our lives, the proclamation of the gospel, and the promise of the Spirit. Oh, by the way, you can't do any of it apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. So wait for him. Don't do anything until he comes. (laughs) Um, What more could we want? (laughs) What more could we ask for to do what Jesus has called us to do, uh, to spread the good news? Um, Well, I want to turn over to John chapter 20 now because we're going to follow up this first appearance to uh, the 11 or the 10 at that time, I think. Um, And uh, beginning in verse 24, John 20, 19 through uh, 23 describes that same scene of of the first appearance of Jesus to the disciples. And then the follow up in in, uh, verses 24 through 29 is his appearance to um, what I call the doubting disciple or the doubting apostle um, and the other 10 who were along there with him. And, uh, and we're told that this is um, eight days later, probably using the Jewish inclusion of both ends of that, it's probably the next Sunday. We would say seven days. They included the Sunday and the Sunday. So they would say, so, you know, this is like Thomas missed church one Sunday, and uh, he's there the next Sunday. You don't want to miss church. <laughs> um, and it begins with, Tom, now, now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So it explains that the first time, Thomas was absent. Um, You know, when we look at Thomas and we understand him, we can probably guess at a lot of reasons. Um, Perhaps very discouraged, perhaps being feeling defeated. I don't know if he was hiding or scared, or I tend to think maybe just hold up. Thomas was an Eeyore. (laughs) He kind of had this melancholy personality. Oh, well, you know. Um, We see that when when Jesus was going to go down to Jerusalem to raise Lazarus, and and they knew it was dangerous, and the the opposition was ramped up and deadly, and the other disciples are saying, no, I don't think that's a good idea, Jesus. And Thomas said, oh, well, and Jesus said, we're going. And, you know, and Thomas is like, oh, well, let's just go and die with him. (laughs) He's always looking on the the negative side, the pessimistic side of things. Uh, So so we know a little bit about Thomas in that way, but but he wasn't there. Um, So the other disciples told him, you know, this is their report. We have seen the Lord. Uh, So they begin to tell him all the evidence. Well, you know, this and that and Mary and, you know, Peter and these two guys just came from Emmaus, and they, they had lunch with him or dinner with him. And, you know, and, and, and then we were all there. We were all there. We saw him he appear. He ate fish, you know, and we saw him eat. It wasn't a ghost. I'm telling you, it was not a ghost, Thomas. He was there, you know, 
And they're trying to tell him, and the indication here in the, in the grammar is that they were repeatedly telling him. They're trying to, to bring along their brother. Um, but we see his unbelief in verse 25. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. This is obstinate, stubborn unbelief. <laughs> you know, skeptics make the best apologists. <laughs> and he was a skeptic par excellence. I mean, Thomas was a seeing is believing kind of guy. And unless I see it, and I have proof of it, I have to put my finger in his hands and put my hand in his side. I will never believe it. Wow. For once, somebody else put their foot in their mouth bigger than Peter. <laughs> you can imagine the humility this caused later on. <laughs> and so in his... Um, in his resolute unbelief, we see the problem of faith. <clears throat> Why was Thomas so skeptical? Why was it so hard for him to believe in the re resurrection? I think, in short, it's because faith is required. Faith in the truth of God's word, the Old Testament prophecies, Jesus' clear predictions, but ultimately faith in the person of God's Son. Faith isn't just mental assent or agreement. Yeah, it could have happened, or yeah, I think it's probably true. Yeah, I believe it. Um, faith is the confident trust that Jesus is truly the Son of God, who died, was buried, and rose again to pay the penalty for my sins, and as a result, I will make a conscious choice to receive him and his forgiveness and commit my life to him. Faith is placing all of our confidence and all of our trust in the person of Jesus Christ because of his word. And uh, that wasn't enough for Thomas yet. So Jesus rectifies that. <laughs> Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them. <laughs> He's got a glorified body and said, peace be with you. <laughs> so he speaks peace to them again and specifically to Thomas. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Literally, stop becoming an unbeliever and start being a believer like a bombshell to this doubting disciple. Oh. I can't even imagine what it must have been like for Thomas at that point in time. Oh. This, this rebuke, because he, he, in spite of all that he had been given, he just couldn't, wouldn't, because it is a choice, have faith that it was true. But now he knows it is true. Jesus is alive. He's right here. I see the marks. I hear the challenge. I know his voice. And so Thomas answers with really the climax of the book of John and one of the great confessions of faith. Very short, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. For a Jewish man to attribute two titles of deity to the person of Jesus Christ was powerful. <laughs> and the confession is clear. My Lord and my God. My Lord, my Master. <sighs> and my only God. <laughs> he declares the truth about Jesus and now knows that everything that, Jesus, that he'd been told and that Jesus said was going to happen in the Old Testament prophecies had predicted is all true. <laughs> And so he says, I'm yours. I surrender. I believe. I believe. True belief. Not just some mental ascent while I go over here and live the way I want. But I, I'm going to.
place my life at your disposal. Some of you ladies that were in the, the ladies' Bible study know that um, Thomas was known as the apostle who went to India, <laughs> uh, who brought the gospel to India. <laughs> so we have some latter-day <laughs> folks from, uh, from Thomas's ministry with us here this morning. Isn't that great? <laughs> uh, he, he gave his life for the Lord. <laughs> He never turned back. And then Jesus makes, declares this blessing, not on Thomas, but on those of us who have believed without seeing. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. <laughs> you know, he, here's it. You know, when we come to the truth of Jesus by faith, we don't get to see him physically. <laughs> but he opens our eyes our minds, he opens our hearts, and he opens our eyes to the truth of who he is. Um, and he said, blessed are you who believe even though you didn't see. Isn't that the hard part of living life on earth as a Christian? We don't get to see him, you know, yet. <laughs> you know, it's like, if you just show up and I could touch him or, you know, but, you know, it didn't always do them a lot of good. <laughs> it wasn't enough even for them. Because <laughs> seeing isn't believing. Ah, we first have to open our hearts to God's word and believe it, and then we can believe in him. Well, John ends his book, kind of the, the narrator here. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that my, by believing you may have life in his name. So my friends, seeing isn't believing, but believing is seeing spiritually. Following Jesus requires faith. Saving faith uh, in him as Savior and serving faith in him as Lord. Thomas started out doubtful, probably became despondent, but finally, in believing, he became an incredibly devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. Another redemption story. My friend, if you're here today and you've never had that encounter with Jesus, you've never come to that point where you don't just know that Jesus Christ died on a cross and that he rose again and after three days and but that he did that to pay the penalty for your sin and my sin, huh? that we might have forgiveness and that we might have eternal life in him, a li an eternal life that starts now, today. It's, it's a quality of life, not just a quantity of life. Huh? And if you've never come to that decision point in your life, I, I just want to invite you today to, to do that simple thing, to come to place your faith and trust in Jesus and what he has done for you on the cross to receive the good news and join the happy throng of disciples who've gone from doubtful to devoted. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word from your word. I thank you that it's so real to us. <clears throat> I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, you did come, you suffered and you died for us. And that you offer us salvation, forgiveness, life in you. And I just want to pause a minute while we pray and, and ask if there's one here today. And, and you say, I, I, don't, I don't have that. I don't really know him. I've never received him as, as my Lord and Savior. I've never surrendered my life to him. But today, I feel the Lord tugging at my heart. I, I sense that I need to do that. Can I ask you just in the quietness of this moment as we pray to just pray a simple prayer? It's not the prayer that saves you, but it's the reality of your heart and your, your confession before God. But just to say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you were buried and rose again and that you offer me today forgiveness, and life. And so I receive you into my heart today. Thank you for saving me.
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.